Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast and Bible Study presented by First Presbyterian Church in Bradenton, Florida. You can find us here much, pretty much every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock by going to our church website at bradenton.church slash zoom and looking for the link to Breakfast and Bible Study. And with that, I will turn it over to today's leader, Janet. Good morning, everyone. We are in our second lesson of uh, a very short three part series called the first songs of Christmas. And again, for the purpose of attribution, there is the book by Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth, um, the book that I've used as a basis for what we're looking at. Um, she's talking about songs of Christmas. And I know at this time of year, I, I go into my cupboard and I pull out all of my Christmas piano books. And I love to just kind of stop by the piano and, and play a piece or two. Um, and you know, as best I can and enjoy some of the music of the season. Um, it, it's very special when the season seems to go by so quickly. But these songs, as she calls them, have been recorded and they've been in our Bible for hundreds, thousands of years. And music is really important at this time of year. In fact, it's important in our lives in general. Um, it's kind of integrated into our lives nowadays. You can have music on the radio when you wake up, you can have music on in the car when you're driving somewhere. Uh, sometimes it's in the background in stores when you shop. Do you remember the old Muzak? Um, M-U-Z-A-K, it's kind of that. <clears throat> and even depending on where you are, it can be piped outdoors when you're in a shopping area, such as down by Sarasota at St. Armand's Circle. They always have music playing. It's Christmas music this time of year. And of course, what would a church service be without music? from the old hymns to the newer contemporary songs, from the regal notes of an organ to the rhythmic sound of a rock band. Music frames and forms and guides our worship. Music expresses, guides, and elicits emotions. I mean, many times we're moved by a song, by the memories that this song brings back to us. Um, it can alter our mood. It can elevate us and inspire us, and it can lift us beyond our everyday existence, and it can energize us sometimes, get that beat going. It can also soothe us. So it's not too much of a stress when Nancy DeMoss Wolgamoth speaks of the first songs of Christmas, and they're even called that in the little superscripts in my NIV Bible, the Song of Mary, and so forth. She writes in this little book about the Holy Spirit-inspired um, speech found in the beginning of Luke. And we're looking at chapters one and, and next week at chapter two. Because these words, like music, not only express great emotion, but also they cause us to reflect, to reflect on the true wonder of how God works in history, in men and women, to herald the coming fulfillment of his plan of salvation for all humankind. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are here to learn again about who you are and what you have done and are doing in history, not just the history of books and other people groups, but our own personal history. Open our minds so that we can truly understand that these songs of Christmas are for us today, even as they were sung at that pivot point of history so many centuries ago. May your Holy Spirit inspire us as he did Elizabeth, Mary, and Zechariah. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 These songs are what I do refer to as a pivot point in history. And you've all, you're all familiar with historical timelines. And if you think of history as one long line, and it's kind of sequential, People can argue that history can be circular, but we won't go into that now. Starting way back in the past, and we don't know how far back it goes, the Bible begins in the beginning. So let's start there. And then it moves forward with all of the stories of what we call the Old Testament. And then boom, it comes right here to what's happening in these first chapters of Luke. This, what I call the pivot point of history, the hinge, where everything changes at this particular point. And then moves forward um, in the church era to where we are today as it is still moving forward. The pivot point of history 
is where the events before, which was the preparation of the prophets and their prophecies, and then that long period of silence we talked about last week. And then after that pivot point, the Messiah arriving as a baby and growing into a true man fulfills the promise that was hinted at very directly, actually, in the Garden of Eden, a precious promise for all people. And these songs herald the coming of Savior. Now, we began last week with Elizabeth and what is referred to as her beatitude, because it begins with the word blessed or blessed. And this was just like a litany. This was exuberance. Um, it was praise that flowed just kind of unplanned, unbidden from her when her young cousin, Mary, arrives at her house for a visit. Did she know Mary was coming? We don't really know. And I guess it's not really important. But these are the words she uses to greet Mary. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the only way she can know what she says in her beatitude where she blesses Mary and this baby that Mary is carrying. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you bear. Elizabeth recognizes that this is no ordinary baby and she calls Mary the mother of my Lord. How would she know that if it weren't for the Holy Spirit? Her joy at seeing Mary, and I'm sure she's just thrilled to see her cousin, and her joy at knowing that Mary is carrying um, you know, this baby is underscored by the fact, as she says, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. As we talked about last week, that she knew about these promises. This wasn't like, oh, here we are 400 years after the last words of the Old Testament have been written and you know, we've forgotten all about this. No, she knew about this. The stories were kept alive. All those years um, in the scrolls that were read and also um, by means of oral tradition, which is very, very powerful and can be very, very accurate. Um, listen to what the message says. I won't spend a lot of time on reviewing what we talked about last week, but this is what the message says. Um, this is Elizabeth speaking. You are so blessed among women and the babe in your womb also blessed. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb, and this is how Eugene Peterson puts it, skipped like a lamb for sheer joy. <laughs> Blessed woman who believed what God said. Again, she knows the scriptures, believed every word would come true. So they've been waiting for the fulfillment of scripture. And that's what Elizabeth says. Mary, who's also under the sway of the Holy Spirit, replies, my soul glorifies the Lord. And this is her speech, as we talked about, that's called the Magnificat for the, the Latin word that begins this speech. Um, and this is often set to music. And maybe some of you remember a couple of years ago, um, Amy, who was the soloist with our choir, sang this. It's, it's just a gorgeous piece. And Mary, as she speaks, is expressing joy and humility and awe and worship. I, I can't imagine how this young girl feels about everything that has happened and is happening to her. Um, but her words are very revealing. And again, just from the message, I lost reference to the message right here. Mary says, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing with the song of my savior, God. God took one look at me and look what happened. I'm the most fortunate woman on earth. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. And that's the point where we kind of stopped last week. But Mary's song continues. And if you're in Luke 1, um, with Mary's song, we're going to kind of pick up quickly at verse 50 in Luke chapter 1, verse 50. And there's a whole list of things from verse 50 through 55 where she's talking about God. He, he has done this, um, his mercy. She's making reference to him in all of these verses. It's a recitation. And I guess musically, we would call it like a recitative where a person is speaking words. 
words without a lot of melody, but just um, all of these statements about God, a God who is not and has not been uninvolved in the daily workings of human life. That's what's revealed as she speaks, but who is powerfully involved in history. Um, and we read the following. She says, his mercy of him from generation to generation. So here we have the whole span of time going way back and also looking forward. Although we could argue that God, and we can, God is timeless. He's above the restrictions of time. He is still very involved in time and very involved in the daily workings of human life. His, excuse me, um, he is always the same. And the word for that is that he is immutable. God is immutable. And Nancy Reedon Law says this about him. I can find my place here. Here we are. She says the big theological word for the unchanging character of God is immutability. He is, quoting Hebrews, the same yesterday, today, and forever, or as Mary put it, from generation to generation. The unchangeable aspect of God's nature is something we need to be reminded of frequently. For even though Christmas can be highly predictable in the repeated traditions and interactions, each return of the season finds us a little older, perhaps in a different context, in a different stage of life, and if we're not particularly pleased with our circumstances this year, it's easy to conclude that it's too late for God to change the ones that could be changed or to give us what we need for getting through the others. But she says, as you read this, these words of Mary, though, behold your God. Behold him more than 100 years ago, meeting the, when she had talked about meeting the needs of somebody who prayed to him, George Muller. Behold him because one of those children whose needs mm. were met by specific prayer is you today. The times have changed, the names have changed, but God has not changed. And he has provided for past, as he has provided for past generations, so will he provide for you and for me in this generation and to every generation. Mary continues in verses 51 and 2. He has shown strength with his arm. He has an arm. The, the, the term arm is often used as a, uh, almost like a metaphor for strength. If you talk about the arm of God, that is the strength, the power of God. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, or as sometimes it's stated, in the imaginations of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. And those words of Mary echo Psalm 37. In verses 10 and 11, we hear, in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Nancy puts it this, puts it this way. Though evil and injustice may appear to triumph, and certainly we could say that seems the case today, and the strong seem to run roughshod over the weak, the Lord has declared that he will have the final end. As she says, or as Mary says in verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. And again, from Nancy. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Those who possess an insatiable appetite and hunger for God will find that he satisfies them with himself, with his presence. From his right hand, he will enable them to enjoy pleasures forevermore. <clears throat> But in order to this type of hunger, which doesn't come naturally to us, we must become what Jesus calls poor in spirit. That is, we must daily recognize a need in ourselves. 
ourselves. It can only be filled by God. Just as us, the kingdom of heaven. Mary revealed her own heart's true hunger and how she responded to the angel Gabriel's message about what God had planned for her life. Behold, she said, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. To be God's servant, or as the King James Version puts it, his handmaid, represented in her time and place in history, the lowest form of hired labor. A handmaid had no plans of her own. She existed to serve her master. Her life was utterly at his disposal. Mary's reason for living, she was saying, was found in doing whatever would please the Lord. And Mary concludes with these words. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And again, from what Nancy Lee DeMoss writes, generations of Old Testament believers throughout those 400 long years had lived and died without ever seeing the fulfillment of the promises God had made in the past. The easiest conclusion to draw was that he had abandoned his people, that his faithfulness was at an end. But Mary knew different. She knew that the blessing that God had decreed to Abraham had come to life inside her teenage body. She could know by faith, as we can, that the things spoken to Abraham long ago, long before his word to Malachi, would continue unabated into the future, releasing the effects of the curse to his offspring forever. Mary's song ends where the fulfillment of God's promises began. We sing today because God remembered his covenant. We sing today because he will not fail to perform everything he has spoken. So this brings us to the third song of Christmas, the final one we'll look at today. These are the words spoken by Zechariah following his nine plus months of being mute. Is poor Zechariah, I kind of feel sorry for him. You know, we don't pay that much attention to him. It's the women that get all the attention here. You know, Elizabeth with this miraculous baby and her visit from Mary and Mary with um, the news from the angel Gabriel. But Zechariah is the one we actually hear about first. Um, in the story, we find the workings of an omnipotent God in evidence. And we see this throughout the scriptures, how God orchestrates history. And here God orchestrates the fact that Zechariah is chosen by lot to enter the temple on this particular day and burn the incense, just as how later God would orchestrate uh, how the very pregnant Mary ends up in Bethlehem, a long way from Nazareth, for the birth of Jesus, which had been prophesied. God sends his angel Gabriel to speak with Zechariah, just as God sends Gabriel to speak with Mary later. There are all kinds of angelic appearances at the beginning of Luke, and there are also dreams, something else, you know, that we could look at another time. So let's review what Gabriel said to Zechariah back more at the beginning of Luke. And first of all, he says to him, do not be afraid. How often do we read that in, in, in the, the Bible? Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not fret. Um, it speaks to us in our real lives. Anyway, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. So this baby is named even before he is conceived. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Many, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth, and many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord, their God. Some of them have kind of strayed. They've lost faith in God's promises, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the dis disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous 
to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow, that's quite a message for Zechariah to get in the temple. And it, you know, it, it takes him a long time. And the other priests waiting outside are wondering, you know, what is going on here? And then when Zechariah expresses doubt um, about all of this, you know, how can this be? I'm old, my wife is old. Uh, when he is disbelieving, of course, then he is struck mute. And when he emerges from the temple, you know, the other priests are saying, you know, kind of what took you so long? What's going on? And he can't speak. And they seem to understand that something very unusual has taken place at that particular time. The angel's words come true. And Elizabeth does give birth to a son. And when his parents, when Elizabeth and Zechariah bring this baby boy to the temple at uh, eight days of age, which is the ritual thing to do, um, there, there's confusion about the baby's name because the, this is a time when the baby is given a name and Zechariah can't speak. Normally as the male, I assume that, you know, in more of a male patriarchal society, he's the one who would have said his name will be. Uh, he can't speak, so Elizabeth speaks. Now, remember, Zechariah has been mute all this time, but obviously Zechariah has been able to communicate in writing with Elizabeth and she knows that this baby is to be named John. And she says his name is to, to be John. And they don't believe her. You know, they, they assume he'll either be named after Zechariah or after some other relative. Maybe somebody can help me here. Is it tradition that you name in the Jewish tradition, you name a child often after a relative who has died or after a relative who is living? living? Mm. There's something about that. But at any rate, they're not following tradition here. And of course, they don't believe her. Have you ever known something to be true? And you make that statement and people don't believe you? And how frustrating that is. I could relate a, a, an anecdote here and I won't take the time to do that. But it's, like it's, it's really frustrating. You know, something is true. And, you know, I remember telling my parents once, our basement is flooding. And it was. And they said, you know, Janet, don't bother us. They were busy talking. You know, so I went back downstairs, came back upstairs. You know, I, I guess I tried to get their attention. And finally, I just burst out and said, basement's flooding. Why didn't you tell us? You know, it's like the frustration at not having people listen to you. So they go to John and I'm sorry, to Zechariah and, jo and Zechariah writes, his name will be John. So only when Zechariah corroborates what Elizabeth has said, do the people believe her and they accept the fact that this baby is going to be named John. And it's, it's an interesting passage in your, in your Bible. Um, if you look at verses 59 um, through 63, I believe it is, um, which I've just said, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Sorry. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. They don't believe her. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And of course, at this point, his mouth is opened and his period of not being able to speak has come to an end. Um, and the, he has, has a song of, of praise um, and it's sometimes referred to as Zechariah's song or the Benedictus, again, probably because it begins with the word blessed. Um, in some translations, the beginning of what Zechariah says is blessed or blessed. In the NIV, it says uh, praise instead, but it's the same basic idea. And this is his song. I'll just read the very beginning of it for you, beginning at verse uh, 67, or actually 68, Zechariah says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. Again, this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He has raised up a horn, which represents strength, a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. All of this was prophesied as he said long ago through the holy prophets, 
salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So this is the beginning of Zechariah's song. And there we learn that God keeps his covenant. We learn several things in the rest of this song of Zechariah. God keeps his word. He's a covenant-keeping God, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. What God told them long ago, he meant, and he is keeping his promise. Zechariah continues, God will rescue us from the hand of our enemies. God saves. God is a God of salvation. He will rescue us from the hand of our enemies. He continues to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. In other words, God is a God who is worthy of worship. And the word worship itself implies being worthy. And so when we go to worship, we are declaring that the God that we are there to praise and learn about is worthy of our worship. It's a very, very, worship has handed down to us in our present day English from a very, very old Anglo-Saxon word that, that has at its root the word worth to it. And then Zechariah turns to his little child and he speaks a blessing upon this eight day old baby that is going to be named John. And he utters prophetic words about him. Now, how does Zechariah know all of this? I imagine that through all those months of being mute, of not being able to speak, which would be very difficult. Can you imagine going for all that time without being able to say anything? He's probably spent a lot of time in prayer and he has probably pondered very deeply the words of scripture that he has studied all his life. And in this process, the Holy Spirit has revealed to him how this son, this amazing, miraculous son, will be used of the Lord at this, as I said earlier, this pivot point of history. Listen to these beautiful words. And these are words that hold promise for us still today. And I'm reading from verse 76. And you, my child will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the rising sun is often again a metaphor for Jesus Christ. So these are things not just, you know, prophesied over John by his father, but things that are promises for us today. Let's look at these promises. The first is the knowledge of salvation. We can truly know that we are saved. And of course, the word saved is a word that we could, we could spend hours and hours talking about, but how wonderful, how amazing, how humbling it is to know that we are saved. The next promise is the forgiveness of their sins. And we could say the forgiveness of our sins. And again, what joy it is to know that we as sinful people can truly be forgiven. The third promise is about the tender mercy of God. God does not repay us for what we deserve, but God is tender and merciful. Yes, he is a God of justice. He is a God who demands justice, um, as he did in the Old Testament with all of the sacrifices. But John is preparing the way for God's ultimate sacrifice. And because of that, we can be forgiven. And finally, the promise is to guide our feet into the path of peace so that God will lead us. He does not leave us bereft and alone. We serve a God who is with us, a God who is involved in our life as these words prophesy. I can only try to imagine how thrilled 
Zechariah and Elizabeth were to be parents. You know, it's like, we're really old, but oh, we have this baby. What a thrill it is. And, you know, this is such a miracle for them. They, they are truly thankful. And as the angel Gabriel said to Zechariah in the temple, these are wonderful words. He will be a joy and a delight to you. You know, can you imagine this little baby, this little boy who is growing up is such a joy to them. And their friends are also thrilled at this birth. It's so wonderful that they, they can share the joy with people who've seen this happen and are wondering at it. And they're just, they're also thrilled. The Bible tells us her, Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives, heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. Isn't it nice when something wonderful or good happens to us? When other people share in that joy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I can only imagine there's so much emotion embedded in all these words. But meanwhile, not long after this, back in Rome, the emperor, Caesar Augustus, has decided that a census of the entire Roman world should be taken. And this meant that even in the far flung territory of what we call Israel, a great migration had to take place because everybody needed to register for this census in his ancestral district. And so we find that God is using a pagan emperor to work out his plan of salvation because Joseph and Mary, and they're, they're pledged to be married. And I know the whole concept of the, the engagement or the pledge and the marriage is a little different in, um, in those days, but they're pledged to be married. And of course, Mary is very pregnant at this time and they have to head to Bethlehem because Joseph belonged to the house and line, or I love the old word, the house and lineage of David. And so again, God is working in history. He is the great orchestrator, bringing all of these things to pass that have been predicted as the prophet Micah wrote. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And at this point in Luke, there begins what we often call the Christmas story, Luke 2, which has been read and reread over the centuries. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. You can probably say most of it by heart, I imagine. You know, and some of us learned it in, in other translations, but um, the story is the same. And so next week, we will look at our final songs of Christmas, the angels' songs. And there are actually two of them. One is a solo and the other is a chorus. And finally, um, something that we don't often spend a lot of time on, but something that's just hauntingly beautiful. And this has also been set to music. The, the Nunc Dimittis, I don't know my Latin, so Nunc Dimittis, uh, words spoken by Simeon, this, this old man who has been spending his days in the temple waiting for the fulfillment of the promises that God had made so many centuries before. So that, that is it for today. And next week we conclude. Mm. Are there any comments about these? I mean, I never really paid much attention to, much attention to Zechariah's song, I have to be honest. You know, he was there, but I, and I knew he had been struck mute, but other than that, I was much more interested in Elizabeth and Mary. So um, this has taken me, given me a new perspective on mm -hmm. um, Luke 1. I have a question about um, Elizabeth and Mary. Were they almost the same term? Uh, no, and I've tried oh. to figure that out. That's a good question, Pat. <clears throat> um, it says... Uh, in, in chapter one, in birth, or excuse me, in verse 36, when the angel, when Gabriel appears to Mary, he tells her about Elizabeth. And he says to her, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Uh -huh. So at that point, Mary does go to visit.
This is her. And it says that she's there about two, three months. Right. Why doesn't she stay um, during the, to, to see the baby delivered? I wonder. I wonder. I'm just trying to see. Okay. Um, To look a little further on. Okay, in verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. We don't know, do we? Oh, whether know, she six was months there. plus three months is nine. I mean, that's when a baby is. Yeah. yeah. Was she there when the baby was born? We don't know, do we? Uh -uh. Yeah, you know, did she stay to help her for those first few, you know, challenging days when you bring a newborn home? Well, the baby's home already. Baby was born at home, but you know, I, I don't know. We hmm. don't know. That's an interesting question. Yeah, but the, that's kind of the that's kind of the way that everything lines up um, with with Elizabeth and then and then with Mary um, at that particular point. You know, so they're, Mary, about Mary goes, six, they're about six months apart in age. Right. They're about six months apart in age. And I also wonder, and we don't really know, although you know we're, we learn more about Joseph later on too, um, when he finds out that Mary is expecting a baby, did he know anything about Gabriel's visitation to, her, to Mary? You know, and she's gone for three months and she comes back. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things we don't really know. Um, we can we've, always, of we've always been told that, uh, that Joseph was quite a bit older than Mary, Okay, but, but do we know that for sure? We don't know that for sure. And again, if I knew more about all the customs, the marriage customs and so forth, and, you know, and of course, given her Mary's circumstance, she could have been taken before the, you know, the church or whatever. And she could have been severely punished and chose deeply for her. He doesn't want that to happen, but he also doesn't really want to go ahead and marry her. If you remember, he is going to very quietly divorce her. So I'm not sure, you know, they're using the word marriage and betrothed and divorce. And I, I, I know that yeah. the customs were different. There was a legal contract there yeah. between yeah. Joseph and Mary, and he is taking steps to dissolve it. And here is where we get the dream. I mean, there are dreams that take place. God speaks through dreams. He still speaks through dreams today, especially in Middle Eastern countries where you can't worship openly. So then he is, what is, hap what is happening to Mary, what she knows is true. I mean, she may have told him. And can you imagine? It's like, really? You expect me to believe this? But in the dream, you know, the, it, it, he finds out that, yes, this is true. And so there he is. And of course, they go to Bethlehem and the baby is born. And I'm getting way beyond the story here. And you know this better than I do. And then they have to leave. Don't they have to flee from Bethlehem? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they have to flee. And they have to flee in the middle of the night. And again, it's a dream. And they go down to Egypt and they stay there for what? About two years? Two years. And then they go back to Nazareth. And so here they appear in this small you know, backwater town again, Joseph and Mary, and they've got this toddler with them. And, you know, you can only imagine. And even later in the Bible somewhere, there's a reference to Joseph. And I don't know where it is, you know, and it says something like supposedly the father of Jesus. You know, so it, it, you can imagine that there's a little bit of going on. Oh, the, the rumor mill was just a journey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we don't we don't hear a lot about that. No, nope. and, and I imagine there's a reason for that. You know, we need to maybe focus on other things. But these were real people going through real circumstances with very strong emotions, um, and and yet they're faithful. You know, as faithful as Mary has been, Joseph is faithful too. Yeah, he really yeah. is. So, and I would love to, you know, tie in all the different hymns and so forth of, of the season with what we're learning about. And certainly there are all the hymns about the angels, angels we've heard on high and, you know, so many wonderful songs. Um, but in the interest of time, I've kind of left that out. But, yeah. and I, I wish I had 
I wish I could play a recording for you of um, the St. Olaf Choir singing the oh. it, I, I heard it in person once and it's just amazing. Yeah. It's, just, it's so gorgeous. Yeah. You know, and again, I like the old version, not the NIV, but the one that begins, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You know, the old language. So yep. at any rate, that's all I have for you today. Well, thank you. As, as much as that's I like the nice. NIV, there are some things that just really are supposed to be read, recited from the King James. You know, I, I, I do not want to hear Linus on stage. <laughs> telling the Christmas story from the King James or the from the NIV or the message. You know, it's no, it's gotta right. be King James. Yep, yep. And I, I you know, and I'm I'm a realist, but I prefer to hear that Mary was with child, you know, instead of saying Mary was pregnant. I mean mm -hmm. they're both the same, but there's just something about the beauty of some of these older expressions. So yep. is there uh, anyone I'm, who would Go I've ahead. just got a, I've just got a couple of kind of random comments, things that have come yeah. to me as we went through this. Um, you talk about the number of times that uh, that Luke mentions uh, angels and, and angelic appearances and, mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, it's interesting that this is so prominent in Luke because Luke really tended to focus on Christ's humanity, and not not exclusively. But if anybody made it plain that Jesus was a man, as well as being divine, it was Luke. So the intervention of the angels here so often is just, I, I find it to be an interesting juxtaposition to oh, yeah. the way the story normally goes. And we also here see uh, so often the fear not or be not afraid uh, mm -hmm. coming from the angels. We, I think we, we kind of have lost in our culture we've lost the thought of what an angel really is. You know, an angel is not necessarily the floaty, fluffy person in a white robe that's reaching down to protect the child, uh, bending too far over the side of the mm -hmm. bridge, you know, as, as a guardian angel. These were, these were warriors of God. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the fear not always strikes me as being like a four-star general walking into the room and the entire room snaps to attention. And yeah. the, the general says, at ease or as you were, um, right. that's, that becomes the equivalent of fear not. You know, it, it's okay. Take it <clears> easy, <throat> settle down. Um, you, you just, you don't really get that sense a lot of times no. in reading. No, no. Um, I, yeah, I find that, you know, as I, and I, I reread a lot of the beginning of Luke again, because it's like, how often have I read it? How often have you heard it? But how much have I missed? You know, I, I miss so much because it's just too familiar. And you're right. I think we've lost that sense of awe mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, is, that is very much there. Um, and, and the last thing, this is not, not a big deal, but we say that um, Elizabeth and Mary were cousins. Yeah. And that's what it says in the King James Version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But except for yeah. the... And I'm sure not many people re refer to this when the Aramaic Bible in plain English, other than those two translations, they're not cousins, they're kinswomen or relatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That relationship mm -hmm. is not specifically called mm -hmm. out. I don't know that that means anything. I, I've read some text where researchers say that was Mary was actually uh, her niece, that, that Elizabeth mm -hmm. was her aunt, not her mm -hmm. cousin. I, you know, I, I get called Uncle Dwayne by more than a few people who are not, right. you know, my biological, you know, related to me biologically. Right. So right. I don't know how big a deal it is, but it surprised me that cousin really is only used in the King James and in no place else that we're likely to run into it. Interesting. What you're talking about, and, you know, I, going back way back to college, anthropology, where we talk about kinship systems. And we assume that everyone uses the same terms for the same kinds of relationships today, but that's not necessarily the case at all. There are very simple kinship systems where, um, you know, this, the, the offspring of what we would call your aunts and uncles are called your brothers and sisters. Um, I mean, they're, they're, and then there's some highly complex systems. So yes, I think that's a very, a very good point. Um, that, that they were kin, they, they obviously knew each other, um, but there is an age difference. 
And of course, if you know, if your family's like mine, you have generations that are kind of out, out of whack. So, you know, you can have cousins <laughs> that are, uh, well, yeah, total age differences. So that, that could be true. And then of course, in the Catholic church, um, where Mary is considered to be ever virgin, but the Bible talks about her having sons and even, I think there are at least two daughters. Don't they talk about Jesus' sisters at one point? Um, they don't call them the children of Mary. They call them their cousins or something. So because at any rate. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, a very interesting um, situation. And of course, um, in, in Judaism, um, relationships are extremely important. I mean, you think about the, the yeah. uh, I was going to say the clans, but the tribes you know, and how people identify so clearly. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. It'd be interesting to, that's your assignment, look into that more and see what you can find out for us. I mean, really, yeah. I have two uh, comments too. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents' best friends, I call them aunt and uncle. Yeah. yeah. But nowadays yeah. it's Miss Pat or Mr. P. Yes. They don't call them yes. aunt and uncles. No, yes, it's different yes. that way. But yes, uh, Pete's mother, her aunt is a month older than her and still alive. Really? Her oh my word. sister, just to yeah. imagine. So, you know, and she's, still, and she's 100, what, one? No, she's 100. She's 100 she's, also. She's three months older than and her. She's older than oh my word. Yeah. And it's her, oh. it is her aunt. Yeah. And it is really her aunt. And then well, you we call her aunt too, but. Yeah, actually, she's great aunt. Great aunt. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, well, it's just very, very interesting. And you think about trying to draw a family tree. Yeah. And get all of that on a, on a, a piece of paper. It's, it, it's, it's complicated. It's very it really goes out fast, the tree itself. Yeah, you know, exactly. You've got the little branches, but then, wow. It, it just goes, yeah. yeah. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Those are good observations from all of you. Yeah. My mother was best friends with her aunt, and they were the same age as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I've known situations like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 Very definitely. Yeah. Well, I always, well, I don't always tell them. My grandfather would have been 99 when I was born. So... Obviously, he had been married and had a family, and his wife had died, and then he married my grandmother, who was a lot younger, and my mother was the youngest. So, um, chances are, you know, any cousins, true cousins that I would have, would they probably be gone by now? I mean, because everything yeah. is just so skewed, right. so totally skewed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great, great talk today yeah it's always it's always really good to get into the into scripture and really dissect it you know verse by verse and and see what it says yeah and and, and there's there's just a, a whole lot more that that is in the book here and of course in the interest of time we just can't yeah, yeah. we can't spend hours on it but, well, it would be fun, though. It would. Be it, fun. Would. it would. Or even just take a small part and really dive yeah. into it. Yeah. And get, you know, kind of like what, what Dwayne does with some of, yeah. the, some of the studies that you've done, where you just take a small segment and just really, really um, look, in, look into, into it. it. Yeah. Well, get into the mores and the, and the society. Exactly. Um, and, the, yes. and some of the traditions that were handed down particularly through the Jewish uh, yes. heritage that, that we, we have kind of diluted. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we're a melting pot, so we marry off different traditions and we take in, create our own, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. don't. I mean, they mm -hmm. seem to keep their traditions going mm -hmm. year after year after year. And you think of the 400 years. Yes. That, I mean, that's amazing that that, that stayed. It is. It mm -hmm. is. I know I, I didn't listen to all of it, but I, as I was doing some studying a week ago, I came across a, a, a YouTube speech by a pastor named Skip Heitzig. I think he's down in New Mexico. And his whole talk was about the 400 years of silence. 
you know, that whole period. And I, I should, I bookmarked it, I should go back and look at it. And then I also came across recently a long written piece by Greg Boyd, and you might not be familiar with him, but um, he was up in Minnesota and he's talking about the power of oral tradition because oral tradition is, you know, they had this written scriptures and people could read and write. It wasn't that they was totally illiterate. You know, it wasn't kind of like right. middle age, but, you know, but um, how powerful and how accurate oral tradition could be. So there are those kinds of things that are interesting to, to uh, learn about. So. Yeah, it, it, that's also true in, in like the Indians, the American Indian, their tradition was handed down verbally. I mean, they didn't have a written language so much. And so that the oral, that, yes. that became very, very intense and it, it was very accurate. I mean, it just, it kept coming down through the families. And we do you don't remember do your that. No, I remember years ago, and I can't remember the <clears throat> name of the book. Um, he, all, he authored several books, uh, A Black American, uh, and it became a, a TV series, Kunta Kinte, um, about oh, how this yeah. man um, figured out, this is before DNA analysis, but he figured out what part of Africa his family had come from based on right. stories his, his, his family in America had told and got there and found this very old man who was the, the village repository of knowledge. Yeah. And he would the sage. tell the story, yes, the story starting with the present time going way, 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 way back. And in telling the story, this man, and I apologize. Alex Haley. Oh, yeah, Alex yes, thank Haley. Thank you, Alex Haley. Alex Rook. Haley is Rook. listening to this through the translator. And this sage, as Mary said, gets to the point where they learn about how someone had been captured and taken away on a boat. And that was his ancestor. And again, it was this generation after generation yeah, of that, yeah. that they knew they had memorized that. So yeah. they had they developed that part of their brain where they could remember very minute details. And today we just have lost all that. I mean, you know, everything is technology. You just Google it or you, you know, you just go online and find out so you don't mm -hmm. remember it because mm -hmm. you know you can have it at your fingertips and so we've we've lost that part and that's mm -hmm. kind of sad mm -hmm. uh, when you think back at the beginning of this of the country where the the letters of abigail adams were so prominent and, and so important to to learning about everyday life we don't have that anymore. I mean, yeah. we just throw it all away and we don't write yeah. anymore like that we did. So we, you know, that, that historical record is gone. Yes. It's very <clears throat> different nowadays. Yeah. No. So. Well, I well, know thank you need you. to get on with your days. Is there yes, anyone I do. who would like to close in prayer? Well, I, I would, but I just can't talk. That's okay. Well. I'll, I'll say a short prayer. Thank you, Father, for this time together, for these faithful servants of yours who show up every Saturday. Thank you especially for Dwayne, who uh, runs our Zoom program with uh, this. We, would not, we thank you for Nancy. We thank you for uh, Mary, for her um, that her surgery is behind her and that her healing is now underway. We ask that you would um, keep this healing moving forward quickly so she can be um, comfortable again and able to sing praises. Without Mary in the choir, it's not quite the same choir. And we especially lift up to you today, Patty, who has a big decision to make um, with changes in her life. And we ask that you would be a constant and very real presence to her as she goes throughout these days and makes these decisions. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.